Welcome to the Washington Tattoo Podcast, where we champion education, celebrate community, and unite the very best of humanity. Fueled by world-class military precision and cultural excellence, the Washington Tattoo produces unforgettable immersive experiences, creating an atmosphere for people, organizations, and businesses to connect, network, and build impactful relationships. We invite you to listen to this episode of the Washington Tattoo Podcast, where the world's musical traditions come to life. Thank you so much for joining us. Greetings and welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Washington Tattoo Podcast. We are incredibly excited to have co-host Stu Warmington over from the UK. Stu, how are you? Great. Nice to be back. Nice Christmas break. Nice and quiet. So, yeah, it's good to get back into it. Fantastic. We always talk about the weather. We're going to leave that alone today because it's actually pretty nice in D.C. And it's usually, is it doing its normal thing in in the U.K.? Yeah, it's raining. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, we're super excited today because we have a great guest and the the infamous and wonderful Doug Howard is joining us, who was the former principal percussionist with the Dallas Symphony, uh, is also an Air Force veteran, has an incredible story. And we've connected over the years on many occasions talking about music and the power of music, rudimental drumming, the history Uh, And then, honestly, just this connective tissue of service and how music helps community. And so, Doug, it's a huge honor to have you on today. And we're really excited just to to dive into your story and just, you know, hear your thoughts on the power of music. Thank you, Mark. And and it's it's an honor to be here. Thank you. Awesome. So, so yeah, let's go, Stu. Dive right in. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a question we ask everybody, and it's probably the most interesting one we do. And it's basically what what got you into music and what would you know how did you get into it what what was that first insight that that came to you that you said that's what i want to do boy that <clears throat> that's that's an interesting question from my perspective um you know i grew up in a small town uh in eastern tennessee and we had one radio station the only music i heard was country music um uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, not a musical family uh, either, but um, uh, my mom put us in piano lessons. So I think I started piano lessons in about the fifth grade. And so I was about 11, maybe. And uh, uh, the next year, the, uh, the band elementary school band program, I was in the sixth grade then and, and, they did uh, for the first time a separate drum group uh, keep us away from the from the brass players, <laughs> and uh, so I did that. Uh, m- moving into the seventh grade uh, at the middle school, uh, new band director. Uh, he was a, a saxophone player, but he insisted that we start to learn our our drumming rudiments, the, those of us in the seventh grade percussion section. And um, did that for another another year. And ninth grade went over to the high school and found myself uh, at the top of the heap of the of the high school band in the night in the ninth grade. Nice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so I continued to work on my uh, rudimental playing. And uh, that year I played my first contest solo uh, in the spring and I, I chose the, the Connecticut halftime hmm. uh, <laughs> as my, as my, as my solo classic. And then, oh, and interesting about that is that when I first started working on it, I, I couldn't get, through, I didn't have the endurance to get all hmm. the way through it with all the repeats. By the time I went to contest, you know, I had built up that endurance and 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 made it to the end and got it had a good result. And uh, so I was very encouraged by that. And then that summer, um, really, someone came into my into my world who who really changed my 
my life going forward. He he was a a drummer from a small VFW drum and bugle corps in our hometown. It was the best musical organization in my town when I was a kid. Wow. Um, but it had fallen on hard times. And so this young man who was only a year ahead of me in school decided to, to join the high school band and uh, took me under his wing. And, and we put together with his leadership, a, a really nice high school marching band uh, drum line. Pro one of the few, if not the only rudimental drum lines in, in the state of Tennessee when I was in high school. And so I credit him with really kick-starting my, my passion for drumming and, and, and getting me moving in the right direction. Um, graduated from, from high school in, in 1966, uh, enrolled at the University of Tennessee, uh, <clears throat> where I was part of the marching band. But my, I found out when I got there, my scholarship also included uh, being a member of the, uh, a student member of the Knoxville Symphony. Huh. Well, I'd never played in an orchestra before. <laughs> but thanks to my mother, uh, I had been introduced to classical music in high school um, because she went on a business trip with my dad to New York and came back with a, a handful of recordings uh, that she purchased, LP recordings in those days. Hmm. And, uh, and so I was listening to classical music a lot in high school. So playing with the orchestra really got me started in that direction. And so I did that for all four years of, of undergraduate. And 1970, when, when I graduated, the, the uh, Vietnam War was still going on, and the first draft lottery was held uh, during my senior year. Wow. And, I, and I got a low number, so I knew I was going to be drafted when, when, uh, when I graduated. So rather than applying to graduate schools... I was uh, applying to military bands, and wow. I, I, on spring break, my senior year, a, a buddy and I drove to Washington D.C., and I took five military band auditions that week in Washington, and then we went on up the. After that was over, we went on up to West Point, where I auditioned for the West Point band, and. Um, I ended up, I had a number of choices, which was nice. And I decided I wanted to go play with the U.S. Air Force concert band under Colonel Arnold Gabriel, who wow. had a reputation as, as he was the preeminent band leader at that time in Washington. Uh, I was advised that, that playing in his band uh, was more like playing in a professional orchestra and so I, I did that. And I have to say that prior to going to that band, I, I really didn't have any, e even an inkling about being, becoming a professional or orchestral player. Um, but being in that band and it, the way it operated was very similar to the way a professional orchestra operates. And uh, we did we did mostly concert work. I I marched in one parade, two parades, I guess, in four years, and um, and I played one time at the White House uh, with the band on the on the South Lawn of the White House. Nice. So mostly it was concert work, and we toured twice a year. We traveled all over the United States playing concerts. Uh, and mostly in uh, high school gymnasiums. Occasionally, we'd get lucky and be in a real concert hall. But uh, but that was that was the life in the band, uh, and it really prepared me for what came next. That's amazing. I mean, and there's a lot of great folks who were involved with the Air Force Band around that time too. Because I mean, you started thinking about 
uh, you know, the Aubrey Adams of the world. You think of, you know, Ed Teleki. You think of John Bosworth. I mean, there were so many folks that were connected from the Air Force being, you know, really cutting edge with, you know, 1950s and 60s with the pipe band and the drum right. corps, but also the story of this incredible concert band, which, you know, is one of the premier musical units in the United States. So, I mean, it's really incredible that you got to perform with this, you know, world-class musical organization. And then how did that transition then to, you know, working with the Dallas Symphony? Is that now, is that a direct, you left the the military to go directly into that gig or how did that work? Well, not exactly, but, uh, you know, I should say this, it be, being in Washington, D.C. for those four years, uh, one, I was able to to get my master's degree at Catholic University there wow. during while I was serving. And uh, the Kennedy Center just opened a few months after I arrived in, in Washington oh, in wow. 1971. So orchestras from all over the country and some from Europe, too, were coming to Washington to play in the new Kennedy Center. And so I heard a lot of different orchestras. Um, I had an opportunity to study during my time in the band with, with some of the leading orchestral musicians in American orchestras. Um, Alan Abel in the Philadelphia Orchestra. Uh, I've, I flew to uh, Cleveland a number of times to take timpani lessons from Cloyd Duff. The, the Both of those gentlemen are in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. PAS. Um and I also did my master's degree with Tony Ames, who hmm. was the principal percussionist of the National Symphony. And until just, you know, maybe eight or nine years ago, he mm -hmm. was at the National Symphony. Um, so it was a great opportunity being in, in D.C. I did take one audition. Uh, Tony insisted that I take an audition in 1972 just to see what it was like. Mm -hmm. And it was for a major American orchestra, and and no one was more surprised than I was when they offered me the job, <laughs> which Amazing. I had to turn down because I still had a commitment to the Air Force for another couple of years. Uh, <laughs> but that was, you know, that was really totally unexpected. Hmm. Um, but as my time in the band drew near an end in, in uh, 1974, I auditioned for the Louisville Orchestra in Kentucky. Uh, I went up to New York to audition for the music director. He offered me the job as principal percussionist. And he, then he said, would you like to come to Aspen this summer? Well, I didn't really know where Aspen was. <laughs> frankly. Uh, but I, I said, of course I said, yes. And then I had to get Colonel Gabriel's help to get me out of the service a few months early so that I could do this. And he, mm -hmm. and he helped me do that. Um, but I went to, to the Aspen music festival and studied for nine weeks that summer with, with Charles Owen, who's also a member of the PAS Hall of Fame and was a former principal percussionist of the Philadelphia Orchestra, um, had retired and was teaching at the University of Michigan. So I studied with him and played alongside him in the orchestra for nine weeks. And that was a life changing experience, really, uh, to, to play with a man with his experience. And by the way, he spent 20 years in the Marine Band. Huh. Before, before he played with the Philadelphia Orchestra. So I never knew that. He did. He, he had 20 years in the Marine Band, 17 in the Philadelphia Orchestra, and about 10 years teaching at the University of Michigan after that. So quite a career. Incredible. Uh, anyway, uh, he, was, he was just wonderful, and I learned so much from watching him operate. At the end of the summer, my wife and I moved to to Louisville, where we both played in the orchestra. And in May of that year, or April of that year, I auditioned for the Dallas Symphony and uh, won that position. And uh, 
right after the end of the season in May, I moved to Dallas and started playing their summer season. So that was in 1975, and I was there until, what, 2018. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> <A> long time. <laughs> That's incredible. So obviously you've, you've gone from the, the, you know, the high school bands into the service bands and then into, into the orchestras. Who was your, uh, who did you look up to? Did, did, did that change throughout you as you molded your career or was it always the, the same, the same percussionists? Well, I, you know, in addition to those gentlemen that I already mentioned who, who were teachers of mine and all, all were mentors and later became friends. And, and in Charles Owen's case, we became colleagues because he invited me, you know, seven years later after I had studied with him, he invited me to come and be a sabbatical replacement hmm. for him uh, in Aspen. And it, and I thought it was for one year, but I've been there ever since. That was 1982. <laughs> So, um, in addition to those, there were a lot of other players that I admired. Uh, Dan, uh, Fred D. Hinger, Dan Hinger, um, who was the timpanist wow. of the Philadelphia Orchestra and later the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, was a man that I, whose playing I really admired and still do. Uh, listen to his recordings, and I just, you know, he made the timpani sound like a string bass or a, sometimes even like an organ. Uh, <laughs> it was a really incredible musician. And uh, uh, Richard Wiener, the late Richard Wiener, who uh, was inducted into the PAS Hall of Fame in, in 2018 and, and died just a few months after that, uh, was someone that I really re admired and looked up to. So, you know, there were a lot of, a lot of influences in my symphonic career. Yeah. Wow. So in that discussion too, when you're talking about, you know, making things sound with this incredibly mature approach and you talk about techniques and you talk about your ear training and these folks that you studied with, what was, was rudimental drumming still something that you kind of worked with? Was it more, you know, was it, you know, orchestral snare drum? Was was there any of that kind of, you know, more rudimental drumming, marching drumming? Was it ever something that you used in your orchestral playing or was it something on the side you did more kind of for fun? Well, I mostly for fun. I, and I'll tell you this, uh, uh, Mark, going into my senior year uh, in, uh, in, at the University of Tennessee, my teacher, Michael Combs, had introduced me to the match grip hmm. the year before. And he said, you don't have to do this, but I just want you to be aware of it. Um, but he said, if you're comfortable with what you're doing, and I, and I was, you don't have to change. So that summer I went to teach, I went to work on the stage crew at the Interlochen uh, Arts Academy, the uh, National Music Camp it's called. Mm -hmm a summer camp. It's, it's one of the leading summer camps for high school, uh, and, and younger musicians in America. Uh, they have, you know, three or four orchestras going all summer. And, uh, so I went to, to work on the stage crew. We had a, uh, a wind ensemble of mostly staff and college students who were on the, on the staff. And one week, we were playing a piece that had a lot of big snare drum solos in it, but it all, you also had to play multiple drums, tenor drum and, and a bass drum was over on the left. And, and I, I really wanted to play traditional grip because that's how I was playing. Mm -hmm. But I kept getting caught on the rims, <laughs> moving around. So I said, okay, I've got to do this match grip. So I flipped over my left hand played match grip and it went really well. I even got complimented in the next rehearsal by the conductor after the concert. So I thought, you know, I'm going to give this a try. So I spent the rest of that summer playing match grip. And in the fall in the marching band at the university, whenever we weren't marching, 
we were actually sitting in the stands or in the in the band hall i played match grip and and i and it kind of w was working for me so by the time i auditioned for the military bands in march of of that year i had it going pretty well matter of fact uh, mark i don't know if you ever met carwood whaley uh, I, I did. Um, I was many, many years ago. Yes. Okay. So Gar was in the army band at the time I auditioned for the army band. Interesting. And, and, and I played this audition and they kept pulling out more and more snare drum things for me to read and sight read. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I found out later and Mark and I are, I mean, uh, sorry, Gar and I are great friends uh, and have been since the, the DC days. But I found out that he didn't believe that anyone could play match grip. He'd never seen anybody play match grip that was worth a darn. <laughs> <laughs> and so he was putting me through the ringer to see if I could do it. And apparently it worked out pretty well because they did offer me a spot in the army band. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, so I had switched by the time I got to DC, I was, you know, I was playing match grip all the time mm -hmm. and it continued that. I believe I may have been the first match grip player in a DC military band. Interesting. Wow. Uh, I can't prove that, but I, I don't know of anyone else who was playing match when I got there. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, and it's, uh, yeah. But, you know, so, and that, I carried that through to the orchestra. Uh, and that's how I played, how I still play in the orchestra but occasionally i would uh, after i especially after i bought a rope drum i would <laughs> break out the, the traditional grip again and 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 get back into it um so i mean i don't i don't even remember i don't even remember what question i'm answering but <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it, it's all good but, it, but it's interesting you, you know you talk of going from traditional to to match grip and it's just another tool in your toolbox that you can you can pull out when you need to so when you approach music obviously you go from film scores to symphonies to whatever do you have a do you have a way of approaching music is it always the same way or does it depend on the style of how you're going to interpret it well I mean, you know, you get you get a new piece of music on your stand. Um, first thing you you do is uh, first thing I would do is first of all look to see what what instruments do I what instrument is appropriate for this? What instruments do I need? What implements I need? Um, and and then. Once you've figured all that out, then you go through and and uh, and look for um, any kind of rhythmic issues or or uh, you know technical issues that you might have to deal with and and work work on. Um, but and and technique having good technique is very important, but it's not the only thing that you need to have because uh, I always say that, uh, you know, musical phrasing and, and the concept of, of what kind of sound you want uh, is equally important. So you can have, you can have the greatest technique. And if you don't think about those other things, then uh, you're, you're going to be lacking in, in an, ele an important element in your performance phrasing. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah, I agree. Phrasing and it's just having that understanding of the music and what, what that music is trying to portray is, you know, yeah. it, it's so yes. important rather than just looking at the, the you know, the, the music on the page and just playing it. So, and I, and I love that detail of it too, because I know when you, you work with a young musician or an, honestly a young professional in anything, they're working on the details. They want themselves to perfectly execute the details of the mechanics. And the mechanics are incredibly important. But as a musician, as you start to develop and you're exposed to new works, new orchestras, new styles, your ears start to develop their own types of chops. And what I love about it is that 
sometimes, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not, I would say my prime was maybe about five to 10 years ago. And I, I kind of have accepted that. <laughs> and, and um, but what I always feel though, is that your ears are always maturing. If you allow it, if you allow yourself to constantly learn, your ears are always going to mature. And so throughout your entire life, whether it's, you know, school, music, business, reading, anything that you're invested in, if you allow yourself to hear things a certain way, your brain then computes that information. And so when you're talking toolkits and techniques, whether you're playing Stevens grip or traditional grip on mallets, you're playing vibraphone, timpani, marimba, you're exploring sound at, especially if you've been ex exposed to great musicians and great orchestras or great ensembles, you're computing new sounds that you're hearing with the technique that you currently understand. And I always find that there's this almost like chicken and an egg asking, can I play it that way? Can I copy it? How do I work on my technique to create those new sounds? And right. that's where I love this concept of working from traditional to match grip with, you know, hearing the Hinger story, which I didn't know, which I think is an amazing concept of how you get timpani to sound a certain way. But that's all probably that's influencing your your snare drum playing, your accessories playing and everything else. So um, as a performer, I know you also taught as well. So, I mean, could you speak a little bit on maybe your journey on how you took those sounds and then you had to communicate that to teach it, I would imagine, right? Right. And well, one thing uh, that you'd be interested in is that I, I think that the that in the schools, the, the teaching of, of, of the rudiments kind of went away in mm -hmm. a lot of school systems. Uh, and so I would have students arriving at Southern Methodist University who had never played any rudiment, rudimental solos. Mm -hmm. So I, I made sure that everyone who walked in the door there, we did Pratt. We played mm -hmm. Pratt solos. Um, I had once I had one graduate student who had never done any of that, and by the end of his first year, he had written a book of rudimental solos, which is published wow. now. Yeah. So, Incredible. you know, I felt really not good about that. That that uh, he he got into it and really enjoyed it. Um, so, I did that because no matter what you're doing in percussion, your hands get developed by working on the rudiments. Mm. And um, so your whole feel and, and touch on a drum can be improved uh, by working on the rudiments. So there's that. I noticed that, um, I have noticed over the years teaching at the Aspen Music Festival that the level of tech, technical ability of the students that we get today is far superior to what it was when I started there in the early 80s. Uh, there are, these kids are playing at their age in, the, in their late teens or early 20s mm. are playing at a level that I didn't even imagine when I mm. was their age. Uh, but the one thing I noticed too is that they don't always have the music, the musicianship yet yeah. to, to apply the technique that they have in a way that, that is really pleasing. Uh, and so one of my goals as a teacher is to try to get them to think about you, you know, directing that technique into uh, musical playing and, and listening, uh, using their ears, being aware of, sounds the sounds they're producing uh you know what what aspect of technique helps you to to play a drum so that it sounds like a musical instrument i love that you're bringing that up because uh, this past summer i had the privilege to adjudicate the modern snare drum competition in cleveland and you know co-sponsored by the cleveland orchestra mark demolakis and tom sherwood who have run that contest for quite a while and that you're right, the technical playing of these folks is just through the roof, absolutely incredible. But the understanding of what is the drum sound like 
in the auditorium that it's being performed in, the, the dynamic range of the piece that's being performed, and how does that fit, are all things that you're only going to learn those after years and years of performing, you know, hopefully professionally, but at least getting enough, you know, uh, amateur to, to, you know, maybe um, just under professional playing. And you, you have to kind of put those in your toolkit of, all right, I've played in this kind of room before. I'm going to need to potentially change my sticks. I'm going to need to potentially change a little bit of the tuning of the drum. And I mean, those are some of the, the technical aspects that don't necessarily have to do with technique, but just that ear development and that ear training. But if I have to change and say that the drum head is a little bit looser or the sticks are a little smaller, or the sticks are a little larger, I need to have the, the technical maturity to adjust my technique to create that different sound. And if you've never done that, um, that's a hard lesson to learn on the fly. So you want to put those practice hours in to be able to pull that off. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's interesting you're talking about students now having, having the technique a lot sooner than maybe would have had years ago. And this is, this is now the, the modern age where YouTube, where you know, the, the knowledge is just infinite. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not all brilliant, but there is a lot out there that wasn't there. So you know, the technique yes. is progressing so fast, but so is the in instruments are changing. You know, you know, years ago, a, a drum practice pad was just a bit of wood with some gum rubber on. And now these practice pads aren't silent. <laughs> They're loud so people can make YouTube videos and all the rest of it. So, you know, when I go to the NAMM show, I see like violins and you, you think a violin's a violin, but every year there's a new product that's different, that's slightly different. So did you see some of this coming in, all these auxiliary percussion instruments coming in to the orchestra as well, all these different types? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um the, the composers, uh, first of all, have been influenced by a lot by the Hollywood, uh, the, the film uh, orchestras out there. Um, they've been very innovative and, and, and uh, created a lot of uh, demand for instruments that we don't normally see in, in an orchestra. So... Uh, and another thing that's happened is orchestras are now playing uh, film scores a mm. lot, at right. least in the in the states. I don't know how it is in the UK, but yeah. um, our orchestras are are playing live soundtracks with the films. Yeah, and uh, it's changed the game. It's and it's changed the job of a of, especially for a principal percussionist in an orchestra. Uh, the demands of of pulling together the instruments that are needed for some of these film scores, but um, and, you know I, I haven't talked about this, but um, I did have a uh, an opportunity to play in a world music percussion group um, beginning in nineteen ninety, I think. We had built a new concert hall in Dallas, and for the first time, the Dallas Orchestra had its own home, uh, and we had a percussion studio that was large enough that we could have rehearsals in it. Mm. And four of my friends and I put together a, a group called D-Drum, which is a world music percussion quintet, and we started initially just playing for fun. We were learning some African drumming um, from a book, if you can believe that. <laughs> and that did not go really well. But uh, <laughs> but we, you know, we enjoyed getting together every week and 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 playing these drums. Um, but then we started to expand into other other types of music a lot of it which we created on our own. And then also we got into the Indonesian gamelan. And uh, two of the members spent probably eight or nine summers in Bali studying wow. Balinese gamelan and bringing back what they learned to the rest of the group. And we incorporated it into our, into our uh, 
our repertoire. But uh, in night, let's see, in 2011, we performed a piece that was commissioned by the Dallas Symphony for our group to play with the orchestra. It was written by Stuart Copeland, the drummer wow. from The Police. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a film out there about that, uh, a documentary about that whole experience of working with Stuart Copeland and, and creating this this piece. And uh, Mark, if you like, I'll, I can send you a, a link to that. Yeah, I would love that. Thank you. Um, but so for me, I was the only one in the group that really had no training in any any world music. I had none. <laughs> um, you know, the, Ron Ron Snyder, my colleague from the from the orchestra, had studied tabla. Um, you know, John Bryant uh, was a drummer with Ray, who toured with Ray Charles a little bit, and uh, yeah. and Ed Smith was a vibraphone uh, soloist and and really the probably the the leading vibraphone player in the North Texas area teaches at the University of North Texas. He does that. He teaches their gamelan. And uh, so this was a this was a an additional kind of a sidebar to my orchestral career. And I always felt like the fish out of water with those guys, <laughs> but they they tolerated me nonetheless. <laughs> so so but but that was a that was a big you know, we were together for nearly 30 years uh and uh played our last concert uh in 2019 right before i left texas incredible wow. so i mean i'd love to hear more about that so when you take on the role of principal percussionist uh, what are some of the responsibilities that you have to take care of when it comes to you know the gigging the rehearsing like what does that look like what do those responsibilities look like well you have you have different roles as a principal percussionist, you have the artistic role, uh, which in my case meant usually uh, taking the most significant uh, part in any given musical work that we were performing. Uh, like if it were, if it's Ravel's Bolero, I'm playing snare drum. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's, uh, Gershwin's Porgy and Bess, I'd be on xylophone. Mm -hmm. no, so you, you have the most, whatever the most significant part is that you mm -hmm. take. Then you have an administrative role, which actually sometimes takes more time than the artistic side. I believe it. Uh, you have to assign the, the players in your section to what parts they're going to be playing uh, for each work that's going to be performed. Uh, you have to coordinate with the stage hands. Uh, what instruments do you need on the stage? Uh, what's your setup going to be on the stage? Because it's constantly changing. And usually we're fighting for turf <laughs> with, <laughs> with, the, with the brass section or the horns, yeah. or, you know. Um, but, but uh, and working with the personnel manager to make sure that the right number of people are, are hired for each uh, week mm -hmm. because it changes. We had three full-time percussionists and a timpanist, but some, you know, we could use as many sometimes as eight or 10 mm -hmm. uh, for a really large work. So uh, that's, that's the per principal percussionist role. You have mm -hmm. a lot of different obligations. Yeah. I mean, just, just before we finish off, I want to quickly touch on something you said before when you were talking about film scores, because film scores are what I listen to. I absolutely love film scores. So I'm just intrigued to know what your favorite score is, either that you like to listen to or that you've actually played. Oh, well, I don't, I don't know that I have a favorite, but I can tell you that I really enjoy playing the, the, the film scores of John Williams because mm. for a percussionist, they are, um, you know, they're busy. We we have a lot to do, but it's a lot of fun. He has a really great way of, uh, he knows how to score mm. for percussion instruments in, in a very effective way. 
Okay, that's interesting. And so those those are and and of course there are a lot of John Williams scores. So yeah, you know, <laughs> I was in Houston. I was in Houston back in May playing with them uh, the score to one of the Harry Potter movies with the film, yeah. and and it, I hadn't played that one before. It was really enjoyable. Wow, incredible! That's, that's interesting. So with. In your career, are there any specific performances or trips or tours that really stood out to you with, that were either fun from a playing point of view or, you know, it was just a great city to visit? Are there any kind of career highlights from your time with the symphony? Well, I think I, I did uh, five European tours with the Dallas Symphony. We played in Mexico a number of times with our – my first music director was – Eduardo Mata, Mexican mm. conductor and a and a wonderful conductor that percussionists love to play for. He had the best time of any conductor <laughs> I've ever worked <laughs> with. <laughs> um, but uh, I remember con I remember a concert on our first tour in Berlin um, with uh, with Mata, where we played the Bartok concerto for orchestra and the, the the reviews were glowing it was a great performance I, I remember that i loved playing at the concert gebouw in amsterdam yeah um mm. of course we played in london at at both royal festival hall and and the barbican yeah um <laughs> uh we played in uh, also it really enjoyed being at the music Verein in vienna mm. on my last tour Next, well, one of the last tours uh, with uh, Andrew Litton conducting. Uh, that's a gr that's a great hall, and and I'd seen it on television a lot, but never had a chance to to actually be there. So those were uh, those are great memories. Incredible. I mean, that, that's a you know that's a hell of a career you, you've had. You know, from from being <laughs> in a in a marching band to you know all the way through. So. If anybody's looking to to try and get into that sort of career, what have you got any advice for them? Well, for for an orchestral career, I I think it's a it's a pretty narrow focus that you have to have. Um, and once I started in that direction, it, you know, I I had I narrowed my my focus yeah. a lot because. The, the, the percussion world is so vast these days. You, there are so many different directions. I have a neighbor here who teaches percussion world music at a local university. And he and I, we, we are both percussionists, but we are completely different in our, <laughs> what we're focused on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it, an orchestral career, you go down a rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and of course there's a lot more competition today than than even when i was coming up yeah. yeah well that's interesting you say it because even with the youtube and everything that's going on now you have a lot more opportunities that are out there people creating new things new ways to play collaborations but again that's that focus is a huge one but Honestly, if, if you were talking about legacy and things of, you know, encouragement, I mean, what are, I mean, Stu kind of uh, talked about this, but I mean, you, you did a, a lot of teaching as well. I mean, are there, I mean, when you're saying focus and getting into just saying f the basics of that focus, what are some basic fundamentals that you would tell a young budding percussionist to work on? Well, you, first of all, learning how to practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people, we, I always thought I was practicing, but I found <laughs> out much later that I was really entertaining myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So you have to really learn how to practice and, and, and a teacher can help with that. Um, so that's one, that's one thing I think is really important. Uh, you, you have to understand what you're trying to accomplish and then figure out how how you can accomplish how you can get there. Right, right. You know, it's a journey, and uh, certain things that I did every day. Mm -hmm. uh, once I once I had a job, and I had the technique to do what I needed to do. I found that I needed to 
to spend a little bit of time every day just keeping it at the yeah. level I need, keeping my technique at the level I needed. Um, so I'm big on, uh, on creating exercises uh, to keep your hands going the way you want them. That's where the rudiments are, are certainly wonderful. And even as a match grip player, I still played the rudimental things yeah. with match grip because it was great for my hands. Yeah. yeah, I love it. I love it. Awesome. Well, I want to say, Doug, thank you so much for your time today. Um, this has been a lot of fun to unpack your story and just get a little bit deeper. We've talked at length about, you know, things kind of at PASIC at, you know, talk about some technique things, but I mean, really kind of diving into your story today has been inspiring. And I know uh, we have some other work that we're looking to do in the future, staying connected through Pulse of Musica and some works there. Um, and obviously if there is, you know, anything that we at the Washington Tattoo love to talk about is the bringing of stories from the past and how that can influence the future of music. And just to get your story today has been an honor and a privilege. And I really want to say thank you, my friend. Oh, thank you, Mark. Yeah. And, and uh, thank you for inviting me. And Stu, it's great to meet you. No, it's been great. And I've really enjoyed I'll... it. It's been very interesting. And, you know, this, this, is, this is what it's all about. It's hearing other people's stories and how they got into it and what they, you know, who they looked up to and where they got to in the end. Just somebody's journey. It's, it's nice to hear somebody else's. Well, thank you very much for having me. Excellent. Well, Doug, thank you for your talent, your time, your service to the country. It's been an honor. And if anyone enjoyed today's episode, please check out the Washington Tattoo Podcast. Like it, share it, give it a comment. Let us know what you think. And uh, we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Take care. Hey, everyone. This is Mark Riley again. We want to share a great opportunity with you to get your business name out to our listeners. We are looking for individual episode and yearly sponsors for the Washington Tattoo Podcast. So if you love music, history, and want to support military veterans, please take this step with us and consider being a sponsor. For information on that, please email marketing at thewashingtontattoo.com. This message is from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. For PSAs on the best services available to veterans, go to VA's new radio outreach page, news.va.gov slash outreach slash radio.